Of all the many stars in the Tour de France constellation, almost none shine brighter than Michel Battiono, the yellow-clad outrider with the chalkboard. A couple of days ago, I was granted an audience with the great man himself. Le Tour du Burkina Faso, appelé le Tour du Faso qui existe. Cette année, ça fait la 77e, eh, pardon, 17e anniversaire du Tour du Burkina Faso. Dans ce cadre-là, le Tour de France est jumelé avec le Tour du Burkina Faso. Alors, ils viennent nous aider à travailler et ils ne nous ont pas voulu que ça soit un truc euh, à sens unique. Ça dit que mes cousins gaulois, les Français viennent chaque fois au Burkina, ils nous montrent comment il faut faire. Il faudrait que nous aussi, on vienne vous montrer aussi comment il faut faire le travail. C'est dans ce cadre-là que moi, j'ai demandé, écoutez, je voudrais un jour venir au Tour de France parce que c'est une référence à travers le monde. Tout qu'on veut, on trouve que... Déjà, il y a vous, des journalistes qui trouvent qu'il faut arrêter. Arrêtez quoi Parce que c'est un patrimoine national. Je suis impliqué, donc il faudrait... Et c'est dans ce contexte. Ils m'ont écouté. Ils ont voulu voir ce que je pouvais faire. Ils ont visionné les cassettes. Ils ont vu qu'au niveau de l'écriture, impeccable, il n'y avait pas de problème. Au niveau de la communication, étant professeur d'éducation physique, j'arrive à communiquer aussi. Alors ils disent qu'il faudrait qu'ils viennent faire un essai et c'est tout. Je suis venu et voilà ce que je fais. Vu quelqu'un qui fait un effort et il te t'adresse, il faudrait dire que mon ami, je sympathise avec ta douleur, n'est-ce pas mm -hmm. On peut ne rien dire, mais dans le regard, il sait que je partage ce qu'ils font comme effort. C'est ça le bon adroisier, mon ami. C'était toujours un rêve pour vous de... Ah, c'était un rêve et c'est devenu réalité. Ouais. Et j'ai la joie de vivre, bien sûr. <rire>
and all he's got to do is hold it for three miles or five kilometers he's now running towards the finish i think he can surprise himself and begin to smile now he's coming into town at 33 miles an hour he goes through the s's here he now turns for the finishing straight and this will be one of his greatest wins as a stage race rider because igor gonzalez has never won a stage or i told gonzalez i beg your pardon has never before been this far in the tour de france and he certainly before has never won a stage of it and that he was such the obvious pick and nine top professionals could do nothing about it when he went and yet everybody must have known he would have only been able to win a stage of the tour de france doing it this way and now all he's got to do is sit up enjoy the moment wait to the crowd there's no yellow jersey he's far too far behind but he can enjoy a victory in the tour de france and what a way to get it to ride them all the way off your wheel all nine of them and now just look back and watch who finishes second gonzalez takes the day it'll be a battle royale for the sprint and christophe Monjean must surely be the favorite he should be the favorite but watch out for nicolas jalabert he punches quite a big sprint as well there as he comes around the outside in the green shorts they come up alongside the other frenchman and in fact it's going to be jalabert getting the win here and he's the man who started the aggression and he will kick himself this afternoon that he wasn't able to finish it off there's a slight return there by Monjean, but it's not going to be the case and the French there getting second, third and fourth as Ferdiguero comes across the line there for fourth place, just ahead of Peter Vrolik. These men in the orange jerseys though, Phil, they really missed out this afternoon. They had the tactical advantage of having two riders in the group and they must have known that Aitor Gonzalez was going to go out on a lone move like that and they did nothing. Behind him, Robbie McEwen won the bunch sprint ahead of Tor Hushoff to extend his lead ever so slightly at the top of the point standings. And it looks as though the race for the green jersey won't be decided now until the final day in Paris. Richard Veronque, on the other hand, has a pretty commanding-looking post-Pyrenean lead in the King of the Mountains competition. Thanks, Gary. Yes, just time for a few emails before we go. Andrew Elkington, what is Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov doing these days? Do you ever recall a cyclist throwing his bike from side to side as much as Abdu used to do in a sprint? Well, he certainly was erratic. Paul, what is he up to? Well, actually, he lives uh, back at home now in Uzbekistan. After his career, he lived in Italy for a little while, but decided to return home. He did actually, a couple of years ago, turn up at the Tour of Italy just to see what the sprints were like. And I tell you what, Abdu was wild in those sprints, wasn't he? He certainly was. Take a look at this. Well, there we are. That was Abdu in full flight there. Stuart King, you ask, Paul, you were occasionally making reference to when you were in the tour. Have you got any photos of yourself in action? I don't think the camera was invented then, was it? Well, I know you used to write on a typewriter, so it was an <laughs> awful long time ago. I've got one or two photos, but I think they were all in black and white in those days. You did ride the tour, though, seven times. Yep, seven tours and uh, one or two good memories. I think probably one of my best memories was when I finished fifth on the Champs-Élysées on the last day. At least I got there. You certainly did. On five occasions, in fact, he rode the tour those seven times. Going on, Gary Sutton in North Wales. Phil, how many tours have you commentated on and which stands out as your all-time favourite? Well, I've been following the Tour de France every year since 1973 and I started doing television with the old world of sport on ITV and that started in 1978. Um, my all-time favourite... I think we both agree, Paul, yeah. because we both enjoyed the commentary. It was when Greg LeMond won the Tour de France by those eight seconds in 1989. And he's a reminder for us all. These two men have been Siamese twins throughout the race. Now the cord is broken and it looks like Greg LeMond might, but look at the finish by Fignon. They're all turned off. It's going to be close. 27.47. He must do. The clock is counting down. So are the metres to the line. This is going to be incredible. Fignon is bouncing off the barriers here. He's lost the Tour de France. The crowd has realised it. Laurent Fignon has lost the Tour de France. A right on the line as he comes over. 55 seconds is countdown. He has lost the Tour de France by eight seconds. Can you believe that? Donald Fignon has lost the tour and Greg Bavon has won it. 
Much like Greece at Euro 2004, Team CSC are the surprise package of this year's tour. A mixture of discipline, tactics, and not a little managerial nous. And that's down to the bald eagle himself, Bjarne Rees, the winner of the tour in 96, the passionate, taciturn, hard to fathom, domestic, turned champion, turned inspirational team director. I think, first of all, the motivation is the, is the most important thing, because you can be as good as you want if you don't have any motivation, you cannot use your, your power. Uh, now I can see what I missed sometimes when I was a bike rider, you know, that, that a sports director go in to a person and, 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 and follow him and, uh, and try to analyze and, and see what this bike rider person really needs to be as good as possible. I have some riders that, that are not the big stars and, and not the guys who win, but I don't know. I do my best to, to turn them into a winner and, and, and change, change what I think they have to change in, in cycling and in mentality. And nowhere has that been more graphically demonstrated than in the performance of Ivan Basso, CSC's unheralded team leader, at 1 minute 17 behind Lance Armstrong, the most serious threat that the Texan faces. He's not a winner and might never be in terms of winning a lot of races, but win the big thing, yeah, that's, you, can, uh, you, you can win the big tour without being a winner, if you understand me right. I think the first day even was better than Armstrong. And yesterday they were more equal. Maybe a little plus to Armstrong, but it's difficult to say. You know, even is strong. So finally, could he win the tour? He can win the tour, but maybe not this year. But if he's gonna win the tour this year, Armstrong has to have a breakdown. You know, there have been two tours so far this year, the one the organisers drew up and the one the riders have actually ridden. When they sat down in the winter with a bottle of pastis to flick fag ash all over a roadmap of Europe, Jean-Marie Leblanc and his team actually came up with some pretty radical changes. First, they took out the individual time trial from the first week, the one that usually separates the contenders from the rest in advance of the mountains. Then, having removed it from its traditional place on the flat, they plonked it down in the middle of the Alps in the final week, just three days before the second time trial and four days before the finish in Paris. The idea was to keep the race as close as possible, as late as possible, and then see who was the strongest man in what looks on paper like the most punishing final week in recent tour history. As I say, that was the idea. Of course, circumstances have produced a different race altogether. Instead of a serene start with the favourites rolling along in the pack perfectly safely, we've had carnage, broken bones, bad weather. In fact, the hardest opening week anyone can remember. So by the time they hit the first mountains, half the pre-race favourites were injured and the rest, with a couple of notable exceptions, were absolutely shattered. As I say though, the race route takes no account of circumstances and shattered or not, the riders still have to face that murderous final week, just like the organisers drew it up. There's the classification as it stood coming out of the rest day. Verkla, Armstrong, Basso, the top three, with Andreas Klerden an impressive fourth, nearly four minutes ahead of his team leader, Jan Ulrich. Ulrich though, wasn't ready to concede the race or the team mobile leadership. It is for me always a goal to reach podium. I have a series in the Tour de France die nie schlechter als zwei war und das ist mein absolutes Ziel und äh, ich, ich kämpfe auch noch um den Sieg, auch wenn das schon irgendwo, irgendwo so weit weg ist, aber wie gesagt, es kann doch, ich habe immer gesagt, was mir passiert ist, kann auch mal Lance Armstrong passieren und äh, Belucki ist letztes Jahr schwer gestürzt mit der Superform und äh, äh, viele Favoriten sind schon raus, die auch um den Sieg bekämpfen wollten, die fahren hinten auf eine Stunde zurück und äh, Das ist alles, es ist alles machbar. Ja, und, 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 und das geht halt, wie gesagt, drei Wochen und nicht nur zwei Wochen. Und äh, Lenz scheint unschlagbar wieder zu sein, aber er kann auch mal Pech haben. Well, stage 15 was a seven Alper, finishing up at the ski station of Villard de Lon. But another of the favourites pulled out before the start. Iban Mayo, who clearly hadn't wanted to finish the Pyrenees, refusing to start the Alps. The climb up to Villard de Lon in 1989 produced one of the closest stage finishes the Tour has ever witnessed. A titanic tussle between the American Greg LeMond and France's Laurent Fignon, both battling it out that year for overall victory. Now 15 years on, and Laurent Fignon remembers every turn of the pedals. 
où on ne pensait vraiment pas qu'il puisse se passer quelque chose. Mais dans la dernière côte de Chalimont, euh, avant l'arrivée vers Côte 2000 à Villard de Lens, j'ai senti que mes adversaires étaient fatigués. Il m'a semblé qu'il y avait peut-être quelque chose à tenter. Ce n'est pas une côte extrêmement dure, mais évidemment, dès qu'on se met à rouler très vite dedans, ça devient difficile. And now he's looking back at the guys who are chasing him for the yellow jersey. Fignon now desperately trying to gain a few more seconds so that he doesn't have to worry about that final time trial in Paris on Sunday. J'ai donc attaqué comme ça à l'instinct, il n'y avait vraiment rien de prévu et j'ai eu raison parce que euh, tous mes aucun de mes adversaires n'a pu me suivre et j'ai creusé les écarts en haut du col, je devais avoir 20, 25 secondes, 30 secondes. At the moment, Fignon is actually going away and Delgado has given up. He swung across and said, well look Greg, you're the man who wants to win the Tour de France, it's up to you to do it. They're all sitting up. Turnix isn't doing anything either. They've completely stopped racing. Delgado is fed up of making the pace. He's accelerated again now. Le Monde, quite obviously, was not going to defend his position. We could well be looking at the moment in this marvelous Tour de France when the three riders have admitted that Laurent Fignon is the best. J'ai creusé un petit peu dans la descente, mais après, malheureusement, pour aller à Villard de Lens, les dizaines de kilomètres qui restaient, j'ai eu beaucoup de vent de face et j'ai un tout petit peu coincé dans la côte à l'arrivée, ce qui fait que j'ai gagné qu'avec 25 secondes. Mais je pensais que ça suffirait pour gagner le tour, hélas non. <rire> And the crowd are standing up here, their hands above their heads, they applaud Laurent Fignon because he knows that today he's won the Tour de France, I'm sure of that. So that headwind proved decisive. If he'd managed to gain just nine more seconds on that stage, he'd have won his third Tour de France. Instead, it was the American Le Monde who pulled on the yellow jersey in Paris, in the closest finish in the Tour's 100-year history. Now, the first serious break of the day had Richard Vironk, Michael Rasmussen and Jens Voigt in it, among others. Vironk extending his lead in the King of the Mountains by taking maximum points over the Col de Limouche. Behind them was an elite group containing Lance Armstrong, Ivan Basso, Jan Ulrich, Andreas Clerden and Francisco Manthebo, but not the yellow jersey Thomas Verkler, who was beginning to lose time. On the next climb, the Col de la Charasson, Rasmussen and Vironk broke clear, and behind them, Jan Ulrich backed up his pre-stage talk by attacking. We're looking here at uh, Richard Veronk and Michael Rasmussen. They've been in the breakaway for a long time today, which is thinning out rather dramatically now on the climb of the Col de Le Charasson, which punches around 56 kilometers to go. But look at this. Moments ago, and there was a big build-up for this, Jan Ulrich launched himself into space. And a, it's a desperate chase now by Lance Armstrong behind because... They came to the climb, it was Andreas Cloden and Giuseppe Guerini who relayed at the front and then literally out of the back behind them went Jan Ulrich. This is a serious effort to regain some of the seven minutes he's lost. The Mayo Jean, by the way, is in terrible difficulty and I have to say he's not going to come back from this one. Well, if this battle continues as it seems to be doing, I don't think we will see the yellow jersey reintegrate the group as we saw on a number of occasions on the big Pyrenean stages. But this was obviously a preordained plan, Phil, this afternoon because the team, T-Mobile, set it up a lot at the, st the start of this climb of the day. They really turned up the screws and then once Giuseppe Garini had swung off the front, then Ulrich launched himself into the attack. I believe the plan here is to try and isolate Armstrong from his teammates towards the end. But right now, Armstrong has not panicked. He's not reacted to this attack by Jan Ulrich, and he's still got a lot of teammates around him. Well, Ulrich now we're staying with the action here, obviously, at the moment. This looks like Mansebo here, because uh, the breakaway that's been away for a long time, the best-placed man in it was Michael Rasmussen, lying 18th overall, 13 minutes and three seconds. But here at the back of the race now, it is Mansebo, and uh, he is in a desperate trouble, a little bit surprised. Uh, but, you know, when Ulrich attacked, this peloton just dissipated all over the mountain. Certainly was a question of boom, boom, and out go the lights for a lot of riders because of that acceleration from T-Mobile. And they are certainly now, I think, trying to use today as the possibility of moving two riders up to a podium position. Don't ever discount a man of the class of Jan Ulrich. The man there wearing number one, Lance Armstrong, he's not panicking at all. Let's not forget, he's got six and a half minutes advantage over Ulrich and he's riding a very sensible race. On the far side, in the white jersey, you can see Andreas Cloden. He's a big challenger this year. A lot of people have tipped him to finish second or third in Paris, but he was in the earlier part of the day involved in an accident, fell off, and had to be looked after by the race doctor for a number of kilometers. But this today is a serious move 
by the team of Jan Ulrich the night before the individual time trial. And I don't think anybody looking at the profile, Phil, actually expected an attack so far from the finish. Well, they're saying now that Ulrich is, in fact, 20 seconds ahead of Armstrong's group as he continues. They looked as though they were coming back to him, but he's opened that gap again. Mancebo, caught by the attack, is trying to reach the Armstrong group because we must not forget he lies fifth overall in the classification. Here is uh, Thomas Vokler. He keeps on bouncing back. He jumps around riders who are detached. But at, at this minute in time, he is out of the race lead and he's on the shoulders of Lance Armstrong. But, you know, one has to get the feeling that Thomas Vokler, as soon as this road starts to go down again, will try to get back into the action. Well, that jersey has become very heavy on his shoulders over the last couple of days, and I think yesterday the rest day probably wasn't quite long enough for Thomas Vogler. Because of the pressure of this attack, I don't think he's going to come back into the race this afternoon, and it's really not because of an attack by Lance Armstrong, it's going to be because of an attack by T-Mobile, and this man on the front here, the big German challenger, Jan Ulrich. Let's not forget that at the start of the day, Ulrich was a long way down in the overall classification. He was in eighth place. Now, if he can do something special this afternoon, he can put himself back into a position to get onto the podium in Paris. And let's not forget, in his six participations, he has never finished lower than second. Uh, maybe he's just proud enough now to prove to the world that he isn't uh, out of form, out of love with the bicycle and just getting a bit lazy, because that's the rumours right now. He's lost the urge to win this Tour de France. Well, here's his answer. Floyd Landis being put under pressure now to keep Lance Armstrong in the action here. Acevedo as well. This is going to be now a serious attack. Whether they expected Ulrich to attack, I simply wouldn't know. I can tell you, though, that we've had two notable non-starters today, by the way. Iban Mayo, who was a pre-race favourite, didn't start this morning. Neither did Jakob Peel, because Peel is injured. And uh, on the road today, we've had Velotti, Paolo Velotti, abandon. Uh, so we've lost three rides, 157 men left in. Looking at Andreas Cloden here, who's become the new leader of T-Mobile. Uh, but this rider clearly wants the job back, as he's now launched a vicious attack, because the breakaway looked to be riding away with the stage today, and it was going to be a wipeout for Richard Veronk. But we've just seen him pass Tor Hushoff, and now there are very few riders left, Veronk, Rasmussen, O'Grady and Gonzalez, and then we get to Ulrich. Did you see the speed? He went round that corner going uphill. All of that uh, parrying in the press, I think, was a game of poker that Jan Ulrich was playing. You don't lay down arms when you're a great champion, as Ulrich is. Let's never forget this man has won the Tour de France and finished second on five occasions. He was not going to transfer the leadership across to Andreas Cloden. He wants it back from himself. Well, 30 years of age now is a long way to go to his 31, the end of the year, but he is still a fighter. He would have been an outstanding athlete if Lance Armstrong hadn't have lived through the same era because he would have won the Tour de France, likely on four occasions himself. But looking down now, this is a vicious climb, the Col de Lecherasson, which takes us to 53 kilometres to go. And uh, this has destroyed the field. We thought they were going to ride up this climb and just take it in the stride, but clearly Jan Ulrich has had things going a different way in his mind today. Richard Veronk, and he's riding up the climb with Michael Rasmussen. And uh, guess who they support? Here he is. Uh, Veronk has been riding well today. He won the climb over the Côte de Limouche, um, and he's looking for maximum points on this first category climb. It's quite amazing when you look at the time gap. Richard Veronk and this group had a, an advantage of 5 minutes and 44 seconds at the start of the climb, and since that, the majority of that advantage has been wiped out very quickly indeed. In fact, the Jan, the Jan Ulrich group, which is uh, here, is around about three and a half minutes behind the two leaders. Richard Viron would like to survive, if he can, over to the top of this climb to get himself maximum points. But this is a remarkable performance by a man. This is character. Well, I'm, frankly, Paul, I'm delighted to see it because um, people are so quick to write off some of the best athletes in the world once, once they falter. And Armstrong clearly is going to have to be put under pressure now. There's the champion of Norway. Looks like he's getting himself back into the group that's slipping away here. Um, no, he's managed to hold on for the moment uh, to the Lance Armstrong group. Uh, but it's tough. Ivan Basso just playing uh, close attention to one man, Lance Armstrong. And, of course, the Mayo Jean now is slipping away and out of that yellow jersey. But what a period he's had.
Well, what's happened here, because of this big attack by T-Mobile, Armstrong has actually lost a huge part of his teammates. George Hincap, he's disappeared. Tricky Beltran has disappeared. The two men in there who will be able to help him out are Floyd Landis and Jose Acevedo. On the other hand, Ivan Basso has a very strong ally in that group as well with his teammate, Carlos Sastra, who's sitting on the back. The big surprise for me is actually to see Marius Sabolowskis from uh, the Saeco team in the group and not Gilberto Simoni. I think Simone, like a lot of them, weren't expecting such an acceleration. You know, they take a little time to warm up to the climbs. Uh, this man is brute strength, as we've seen so often, and criticised him for it too. Uh, but today, it was clearly a plan. A lot of heavy work done at high speed by Giuseppe Garini. Cloden himself was on Garini's wheel, and then came the attack by Ulrich. Jan Ulrich likes the good weather. Yesterday was a very hot rest day. He went out for a bike ride, by the way, with his teammates. He rode for about two and a half hours with the team and then went out for a further hour and a half ride himself as if he had in the back of his mind something ticking away, nagging at him because he's a great champion. He's won the Tour, he's been on the podium so many times. You cannot wipe that away from him. You know, he really wanted to do something special. And this is going to be a hard race now when I, f I felt they would ride easier this afternoon because of the fact tomorrow is the very important team to individual time trial. Well, Richard Veron could really sew up this competition today if he keeps this up. He didn't score on the first third category climb, but he came in on the uh, third climb of the day, the one that really carried the big points, the Côte de Limouche. And he's heading up to maximum points here on the first category climb because Rasmussen, I don't think, will try to challenge uh, Richard as they go over the top. They are at the moment, it should be in the last kilometre almost now of the climb, about a kilometre and a half uh, still to go to the summit. Then we've got a couple of uh, footsteps up to the final climb of the day, uh, which is quite a hard climb. And uh, clearly this could be a sensible retrap of time here. Maybe some more back in the time trial tomorrow and we could have Ulrich back in the podium straight. Absolutely a great ride. He's actually catching the cars of the riders who have been up the road in front of him the day has really been dominated by a 14-man group that got clear after 53 kilometers and they built themselves an advantage at one stage of over five and a half minutes so uh, this is Aitor Gonzalez getting a chance to see just how good Jan Ulrich is in fact theoretically these kind of mountains today are much better suited to the strength of this big German sh challenger Three minutes, uh, zero 08 to the third group on the road, which is the Lance Armstrong group, which is desperately small right now, and there's only a couple of teammates with him. There is the group, and the Floyd Landis uh, put under immediate pressure here to keep this group going with Armstrong. And in this group, too, and watching is Ivan Basso. So he is a man to watch now. He certainly is a man to watch, but these riders are being put under pressure the day before the individual time trial to the summit of the Alpe d'Huez. I'm, I'm a bit surprised that Armstrong didn't go with the move, but I think he didn't want to find himself in a situation where he was isolated. He's taken the precaution of staying alongside his teammates. As always, Phil, he uses his teammates to the absolute maximum. Well, this is the benefit of having a strong team around you. And Armstrong is relying on just two men now, not the full blue train here. Look at this. This man never, ever gives up. Being trailed by Ulrich's teammate there, Sergei Ivanov. Uh, but Thomas Vokler, a lonely man in yellow. Nobody helps the leader of the tour. You fight your way back into the picture. How many times has he done that over the past week? And still, this jersey is inspiring him to drive his bike on and on. He's slipping behind, of course, and as we speak, he is out of the race lead. Armstrong now looking for a 61st yellow jersey of his career. It's a fair reference if you have a look at the US postal rider who's in this group with him. It in fact is a man by the name of Manuel Beltran who is a very good climber. So the yellow jersey once again riding on yeah. absolute and utter courage. I think the race is going to be just that little bit too difficult for him to recover here this afternoon. But let's not forget he is also the leader of the white jersey competition for the best young bike rider in the race. And that is something that he would like to keep hold of and maybe possibly take that up to Paris. Well, I certainly hope he does, because if, he, if he's destined to lose yellow, then surely he's going to be the best rookie of the Tour. He came to his first Tour de France last year, finished only 119th, and I don't think we mentioned his name once. All changed now. Back up at the front, these riders, I felt it the other day, are desperately tired in this Tour de France. It has been a vicious tour, very, very quick. 44 kilometres covered in the opening hour today, despite all the mountains ahead. 
There is Jan Ulrich slowly but surely picking away all of the riders up in front of him. This is Garcia Acosta on the front from the Balearic Islands team, followed there by Santos Gonzalez, the teammate of Tyler Hamilton. But the yellow helmet there on the head of Jan Ulrich is absolutely charging up this mountain. This is a very brave move and one I think that not very many people were expecting. They were waiting for the next big mountain stage after the individual time trial. Look at that, moving well, across there. The, uh, he almost indicated, I think he did indicate to Garcia da Costa to get on his wheel because he might recover and be able to help him here, uh, even though they're on rival teams. And Vincente Garcia da Costa has said, OK, made a huge effort, but he's on. Gonzalez is latched on as well. He's just cut through this breakaway that looked to be sailing uh, to the day's victories and all of the spoils. And this is the, uh, the Jan Ulrich of old. And I can't recall ever seeing him putting in an attack like this. Well, I think I do. It was way back when he actually went on to win his Tour de France on the road to Arcalis. If you remember, he jumped away from everybody and there laid the foundations of his victory that year back in 1997. But just catch a glimpse if we go back to him later on of the way he's breathing, sucking as much air as possible into his body to keep the energy and the oxygen flowing through those muscles. It's a long attack because he's looking now still at 53 kilometers to go to the finish. And of course, don't forget, there are still three more climbs. Well, well at the top of this one is the Côte de Lecherasson. Uh, 12 kilometers of climbing behind and now nobody challenging as we thought Rasmussen allowing Veronk and a hand goes up there probably for a drink I would think unless he suddenly had a flat tire Veronk looking to see where he's gone uh, but uh, maximum points on the first category climb there for him to surviving a little bit further down the road there is Laurent Brochard just ahead of Jens Voigt Mr. attacking style this year in the Tour de France because his teammate Jakob Peel was not able to start this morning because of a knee injury he was in the early morning breakaway and uh, they're a fair way behind Richard Vironk and Rasmussen I would say around about 45 seconds but look at the time gaps further back Jan Ulrich now is only two minutes and three seconds behind around about 50 seconds ahead of the Lance Armstrong group so there's Brosha, he gets the third place over the top, followed by uh, Jens Voigt, who was for one day the leader of the King of the Mountains in the Tour de France a few years ago. But next up, we're going to see this man come over. I haven't seen Stuart O'Grady yet, I'm not too sure where he is, because at one stage he was leading on the climb, but uh, I think he might still be just ahead of uh, Jan Ulrich. I don't think there's any panic in the eyes of Lance Armstrong. He's just sitting calm and collected, got his teammates up alongside him. But this attack, I don't think he would have expected, although I'm quite sure that his team manager, Johan Brunil, did. Brunil knows exactly what's going on at every moment in the bike race. He's got an awful lot of information in that car with his... He's got the race radio, he's got uh, television. he would be keeping a very close eye on this breakaway by Jan Ulrich. Let's not panic, though. He's six and a half minutes behind. Well, that's, uh, that reminds me of the times when Lance was put into difficulty on the Jus plan by Ulrich, and that was the Wessies don't panic. Well, today we've still got a couple of real serious climbs to come, both second category, one second category, one third category, and the Côte the code de Chalimont. And the last climb is also second category, which brings them right up to the finishing line. It's going to be a tough day now, and the way they've hit this race, there's going to be a lot of riders spread eagle across the Alps. Uh, well, as we start the descent downwards now, Ulrich is going to have to show some descending skills. Not his strongest points, uh, but he's got the gap and he can't afford to let it close now. Well, I think it wasn't his strongest point a few years ago. He seems to improve because, let's not forget, on that descent on the way down towards La Mangie from Col d'Aspin, Armstrong actually backed off on the, on the wet descent because he was worried about actually losing it on the descent and throwing away his Tour de France with an incident like that on the road. I think now Jan Ulrich will take a few risks on this descent and try and extend his advantage before he starts the next climb, which is a third category climb. Oh, well, there's Stuart O'Grady now at the back of this group, which also contains, by the way, Levi Leipheimer. There he is, the small man in the orangish jersey, uh, sitting there in front of the Sambaliaikis. They go over the top, nobody bothering about the points there, with the King of the Mountains topping first. Uh, but it looks to me now as though they will begin this descent, and it's good to see Levi Leipheimer has also made the move here. 40 seconds in between Jan Ulrich and Lance Armstrong's group as we are speaking. Looking further down the road, this is the yellow jersey trying to keep it on his shoulders for one more day, but it's going to be a tall order. I actually thought, Phil, looking at the race profile this morning, that he would survive. But there was only one thing that could prevent him from surviving. It was whether or not these guys went out and raced this stage in a difficult manner. And I think we've already answered that question with the attack of Jan Ulrich.
Well, Paul Ovoid, clear the clock is ticking away and he's now well out of the lead in yellow. We're looking at the face of Thomas Vokler now, the rider who is quite a long way behind, now nearly two minutes behind the action of the day. He cracked twice on the earlier climbs, he got back, but on this one, that initial attack by Jan Ulrich has spread eagle the Tour de France today, and it is going to hurt now all of the way to the finish in Villard de Lens, still away distant. These are the two leaders now, working very well together. Richard Vironk in second place has got himself a lot more points in his quest to try and win the King of the Mountains classification for a record seventh time. He's joined there in this effort by Michael Rasmussen. Last two climbs for Laurent for Richard Vironk, it's been maximum points. And now they're holding on to an advantage of around about a minute and 54 seconds over Jan Ulrich. These two riders are caught in the middle. In the back there, you can just see Jens Voigt ahead of him, Laurent Brochard, who's no stranger to winning stages in the Tour de France. He won a stage on Bastille Day a few years ago on the roads toward Blue d'Anvielle. This is a fairly tricky descent as they get themselves ready now for the next climb. It's not a very long descent, and they will begin the climb of the third category mountain, the Col de Carri, which is around about 6.2 kilometres in length and an average gradient of around about 2.5. So it's really a long, gradual drag up to the summit. Well, this is the beautiful area now. We're racing to the Vercour today, which is one of the nicest areas of France, and it's in the Alps, of course, above Grenoble. And uh, we move along the valleys to Alpe d'Huez tomorrow, where we are told there are thousands upon thousands of people already on the Alp. They have been for a week, and they are advising nobody else to go there because the police are shortly going to close the road altogether. So it's, as we expected, huge showdown day tomorrow. And, of course... Uh, We'll look here at Richard Veronk as he sends the pedals over. He's uh, an, a great attacking rider. He looks for the days when he can grab the points. I thought he'd possibly chosen the day when he might also have grabbed his second stage win. But things are changing rapidly, and Ulrich is coming. This rider, further down the mountain, still going up. The call that all of the leaders have now started the descent at a couple of kilometres down. The gap is enormous. We're looking at nearly six minutes deficit now. It's on the leader, of course, uh, but it's about four minutes on Armstrong, and he's losing ground. It's a shame. This man has fought with so much courage, and I thought he might have just one more day in that yellow jersey and been able to start last in the individual time trial, but it would take a monumental effort by him and a major slowing down at the front end of the race for him to reintegrate the peloton and the group of Lance Armstrong. The clock doesn't tell lies in a bike race like this, and as he comes up to the summit, it's going to stop at just outside 6 minutes and 10 seconds, and my quick calculation there puts him uh, around about 3.5 minutes behind Armstrong currently. Well, that's an enormous gap, and of course, Hilo, he's only got just over 50 kilometres to go. He's got two more second category climbs to come, rather steep, so he can expect to lose time, I'm afraid. We're looking down the two leaders, uh, slowly but surely being wiped out, the riders behind. There's only four riders now in front of Jan Ulrich and his small group. Stuart O'Grady has gone backwards, he's been caught by the Armstrong group, we've just heard, and so that looks like Heras. Christian van der Velde. Oh, he's come he back there. Christian was in, was in the, the early group. group. Yeah, sorry, Christian was in the other in the leading group originally, which looked to be successful. But he is now being caught by Ulrich's group. Well, Ulrich just picking off all of these riders one by one. Let's not forget there were 14 riders in that leading breakaway early on this morning, and that's really set up a very nice situation for Jan Ulrich. Look at this. This is a, a picture of concentration by the man who's won the Tour de France back in 1997 and, of course, has finished on the podium in second place on five occasions. Three of those occasions were when he finished behind a certain Lance Armstrong. Now, Voigt, I think, has decided to sit up here and wait because he knows that uh, the man coming across the gap behind him is Jan Ulrich. And I think he's decided to take a breather and take on board some uh, extra carbohydrates as he slows down for the return of Jan Ulrich, who can't be very much more than around about 20 seconds behind him. Great bike rider Jens Voigt. He's been on the attack for 450 kilometers since this bicycle race started in Liège, which seems an awful long time ago, more than two weeks ago. Now, there, this is the group of Ulrich. Just there in the distance, you can see the dark-colored car. That will be the car of Jens Voigt, and he will come up alongside Jan Ulrich. And I wonder if we will see an allegiance getting formed here, because Ulrich and Jens Voigt, as amateurs, actually used to race on the same team. They race all over the world together as some of the top dominators of international cycling when they were in the under-23 category. 
and the fact is that Ulrich riding together with Voigt may just put some serious pressure onto the shoulders of Lance Armstrong, forcing him to chase and then give the advantage to this man's teammate, Ivan Basso, later on. Well, that's amazing. What has happened right now is, in fact, Jens Voigt has been told by the team management to sit up and wait for the group that contains Ivan Basso. This is a complete and utter change in the tactics. I thought there might have been a coalition formed between the two German riders, but no, what is happening now is Ivan Basso is seeing the possibility of losing a podium position, so they've sent Voigt back to try and put the race all back into state. Well, he is looking like a totally different bike rider today, Paul. This man has come out to put matters to rights. He'll make his German press very happy because one minute I heard Ulrich was boycotting the German press, the next minute I hear the German press are boycotting Ulrich because he bought... This looks terrible here. It looks it's, not, Jens... it's not terrible, it is very intelligent. Jens Voigt has been told to sit up and oh, wait, wait for, for the Basso. group behind because Ivan Basso is in the situation today where he could be losing his second place in the overall classification. I saw Jens Voigt taking on board plenty of food. The reason is he needs to go back to this group for reinforcements. Well... We've seen it happen. We're seeing CSC Jens Voigt, uh, who was in the break, now waiting for the group. There's Basso. And uh, remember that although it's a little bit of a way to go, but I think the CSC team are going to have to help US Postal here because T Mobile, he won't pull back seven minutes today, but a few minutes today and a bit more in the time trial tomorrow. And all of a sudden, we will have Jan Ulrich looking for a podium finish. I can't believe he can get up to yellow jersey right now, but he certainly could be on the podium in what is his beloved second place finish. Remember, he's finished five times second in this race. Now, these are riders coming back, Garcia Acosta. This is Jens Voigt looking over his shoulder, and I would think immediately he'll put himself into the line of US Postal Service riders, and there it is, confirmation of what I thought the tactics was going to be. So Voigt told to come back, wait, and to take up the chase now because Ulrich has caused panic. We always talk about that man as having the greatest class of all the professional bike riders, and now you see why he suddenly has turned on the style. Cloden is there in the white jersey, best placed of T-Mobile, and uh, going forward with no reason to work at all now. All of the pressure is on the riders who are now first and second in the Tour de France, Lance Armstrong and Ivan Basso. So it's those teammates who must do the chasing on Ulrich. It really is quite remarkable to see the coalitions and alliances that have to be formed in a bike race like this just to survive and keep yourself in position in the overall classification. Right now, we're seeing a, a fragile alliance being formed between CSC and US Postal Service because Ivan Basso, I believe, is worried about his second place in the overall classification. He will do a very good ride tomorrow in the individual time trial to the summit of the Alpe d'Huez, but if he gives too much time back to a man like Jan Ulrich on stages like this, Ulrich will almost certainly overtake him in the final time trial. Let's not forget that final time trial is very long indeed, and we have no real references of the performances of Ivan Basso in the individual time trial. It's not his strong point. It's even been described as his Achilles heel. But it's uphill and things will happen. There are many, many thousands of people waiting to cheer everybody on. So if they can, we will see. But we're looking at Veronk at the moment, who's consolidating his overall lead in the King of the Mountains. And here comes Ulrich driving on. He's looking for Brochard. He'll be the next man in his sights. And it looks as though only one rider is now staying with him, and that is Santos Gonzalez. Christian van der Velde has been dispatched by the pace. Ulrich is continuing to nip the apexes of the corners and keep on going down. He took many, many risks the other day when it was raining coming down the Col d'Aspan, and he got away from Armstrong. Armstrong remained calm and he came back. But it does show, as Paul has said, that Ulrich now has concentrated on his descending powers. Something's just coming back into my mind. This is reminding me of a time when we came here in the Tour de France back in 1989 when a certain Laurent Fignon had to go out and make a long breakaway on the stage up to Villard de Lens because he wanted to try and eliminate a certain Greg LeMond on that occasion. He actually won the stage here and he got, them, got himself the yellow jersey back away from LeMond. But later on, it was all, always thought that he'd actually wasted an awful lot of energy on this one stage, and that condemned him to losing the Tour de France at the end by just eight seconds. Rather interesting, really, how history repeats itself. It is amazing, and we're just onto the lower slopes. It's not a very hard climb. This one, this is the third category called the Calais, and it's only a couple of kilometres in length. More points, of course, for Veronk up front. 
Here comes the drive now, and this is Jens Voigt. This is why he went back to the group. He hasn't come off since now, and I bet the US Postals were glad to see that man too. Still to come, a third category and two seconds, including the finish. The Côte de Chalimont and the Villa de Lens climb itself are both pretty tough climbs, or on the Col de Carri at the moment. And it looks as though Veronque has read it right, at least for that uh, climb. Well, Veronque should have a very good chance to stay off the front end for at least one more climb, but the way the pressure is being put on by Jan Ulrich, I don't think it'll be very long before he catches that leading group of two riders. In fact, he's catching Laurent Brochard here, so he will put himself into third place on the road. The race situation is there are only two men in front of Jan Ulrich now. Richard Veronque is one of them. He's joined by Michael Rasmussen. The time gap is a minute. But the time gap back to Lance Armstrong's group is still only hovering at 40 seconds. So Ulrich on the front there, slowly but surely eating into the advantage of these men here. These are the last survivors of a 14-man breakaway who got clear after 53 kilometers of today's stage. That's where they are, the Col de Carri. 137 kilometers into the race and here's the acceleration from Richard Viron. It's a hundred percent success for him this afternoon Apart from the first two small climbs of the day when there was a small breakaway by Axel Merckx who got the maximum points on the Col de Alletrac and the Col de Le Puy Saint Martin But since then Richard Viron has got maximum on the Côte de Limouche the Col de Echarasson and now he's got maximum points here on the Côte de Carry two more climbs to go the next one will be a long second category climb, the Côte du Chalimont, and then after that is the climb up to the finishing line. But I don't think anybody here this afternoon expected a comeback by the man whose nickname is the Kaiser. Jan Ulrich, the great German champion, has been right down, wallowing low down in the overall classification, seven minutes behind the overall leader, Thomas Vukla, and six minutes, 39 seconds behind Lance Armstrong. I think it's a tall order to pull all of that amount back today, but that will certainly rattle the cage of one of the two, one or two of the champions at the top end of the overall classification. This is a brilliant move by Ulrich, a brave move by Ulrich. He stands a chance today of losing absolutely everything, but he's not worried. For him, it's pride that's at stake. Jens Voigt on the front here. Sticking away, doing a magnificent job here for his teammates. Just, just behind Armstrong there, you can see Ivan Basso in there as well, Carlos Sastre. Now, over the top of that climb, Ulrich, Santos Gonzalez from Fonac team, and, of course, Lauren Brochard, who they've picked up. Now, we should have a fairly long descent coming up right now as they drop down from the summit of the Col de Carri right down to the small town of La Chapelle en Vercourt, then down into Saint Martin en Vercourt, then the climb up to the finish begins. Well, there's Christian van der Velde swept in now from the leading bunch. And there's very few men left up front. Look at the face of Jens Voigt. One minute he was driving the attack of the day and he'd been out front in it for most of it. Then he sent back to pace up Ivan Basson, of course, without any option. Armstrong and Levi Leipheimer as well, as they now try to reduce the damage being done and by the man they all feared, even though he was seven minutes behind at the start of the day. And it's going to be a doer battle now, because at the moment, he is starting to limit the losses now. This pacemaking by Voigt is beginning to hold back Ulrich. Well, looking down the group there, I've uh, had a hard time spotting as to whether or not Georg Tochnik is in this group. He was the man who started the day in sixth place in the overall classification. Wears a pale blue jersey of Gerald Steiner. But one man who is definitely in this group is the American rider Levi Leipheimer. Leipheimer was 14th overall at the start of the day. And with this move, as we see developing here, he could find himself climbing up right into the top ten at the end of the day. Much further back. The yellow jersey here on the shoulders of Thomas Vukla, a lonely man here with this yellow jersey on his shoulders. He will get no help from anybody at all in this group. And in fact, it's rather sad to see that his team seem to have completely and utterly blown to smithereens on this very crucial stage for him. But it's not surprising. They've done a magnificent job over 10 days to keep this young man in the overall lead. Picking up teammates, one or two riders dropping back. They were in front of him on this last climb, the Col de, Ch the Col de Carri. 
and look at that time gap a minute 25 is the time gap between the two men at the front and the Jan Ulrich group but it's almost four and a half minutes back to the yellow jersey it's going to be very difficult for that young man to pull himself back into the race this afternoon condemned not by an acceleration by Lance Armstrong but by one Jan Ulrich who is now off the front end of the main field here are the two leaders in fact, they're starting to open up the gap again because uh, Vironk and Rasmussen are now in extending their lead over the Ulrich group to a minute and 22 seconds while Ulrich is still hovering. Oh, this is Ulrich going around the corner there, nearly dropped it again. He's taking an awful lot of risks here, Jan Ulrich, to try and get him as much advantage as possible. Now, a few years ago, when Ulrich was in the lead, he was put in a lot of difficulty on the descent, and he earned himself uh, the nickname of not being a very good descender. Now, it looks to me as if he's uh, actually planned this attack here this afternoon. He's got a very light pair of wheels on, very deep rims, which makes those wheels exceptionally rigid. Time gaps, by the way, the Armstrong group uh, running at 2 minutes 18 on the leaders and uh, they're about uh, about 36, about 50 seconds behind Ulrich's group. So they're coming, but it's taking an awful lot of work. And Ulrich is taking an awful lot of risks. He almost lost it going around that corner and I think uh, he's trying to uh, take as many risks as possible to extend the advantage on the descent. And maybe he thinks he might put Armstrong into a spot of bother and Armstrong will continue to take risks. He's not going to at all, you know, because Armstrong is a, a magnificent bike rider. And in the past, we've seen Ulrich not really being able to take the right lines around corners. It reminds me of when he won the Tour de France in 1997. He actually almost lost the lead on the descent of a mountain. Yes, he most certainly did. And as we know, on one tour, he went off the mountain and Armstrong waited for him as he came down the Col de Perisord. 38 kilometres to go now and uh, two second category climbs remain. In those 38 kilometers, we are probably only going to be on a flat road for approximately 20 of them. Rasmussen and Vironk are still trying to stay away, and they're both quality bike riders in the mountains, so there is a chance for them. But unfortunately, they're getting mixed up now in a battle for greater prizes, and that's who's going to win the Tour de France. And it's not going to be Thomas Vokler anymore. He is now, this time, lost far too much time. But Lance Armstrong joining forces, strangely enough, with CSC to try and control the man that I reckon everybody must have thought was down and out. Well, one man knew that he wasn't, and it was Jan Ulrich himself, and I'm quite convinced that over the rest day he pushed everybody away and he locked himself into his room to get back the concentration required to try and challenge Armstrong for this victory. Ulrich is a great champion, he's always been a great champion, and champions have pride, and that's why he's gone out here this afternoon. He's so far down in the overall classification, 6 minutes 39 seconds behind Armstrong, and today he's hoping to reduce that gap going into the individual time trial tomorrow, where he'll probably lose a little bit more time, but for him, he's still got a very serious crack at the podium. Well, the riders were being told is in that Armstrong group, uh, are his teammates Jose Acevedis and Floyd Landis, and also in there, of course, Andreas Cloden, Aito Gonzalez, the winner the other day, Basso, Carlos Sastra, Jens Voigt, who's doing a lot of the pacemaking. Uh, Christian van der Velde, I think, is already unhooked at the back. Levi Leipheim is still there. And Maria Sabaliauskas is also there. So as far as we can work out, Paul, Geo Tochnig is losing ground here. Yeah, it appears as if Georg Tochnik has missed out, and uh, also the man missing out from the group as well is uh, Francisco Mancebo, yeah. the man who was in fifth place in the overall classification. So Levi Leipheimer is actually going to make a very good operation this afternoon, and I could see him by the end of the day possibly climbing into the eighth or ninth position overall. Which would be a superb jump for him, and more importantly from Jan Ulrich's point of view, uh, with a couple of guys missing out, even Ulrich uh, could be back into the top six of this Tour de France. Amazing. So looking down now on the two leaders, and here are the three chasers. Sorry about uh, a little bit of picture breakup. That's uh, because of the area we're going through. We're in the high mountains in the plateau of the Vercors. Vercors is a, a very large area in France, uh, 17,000 hectares of national park. Absolutely magnificent. The wild animal up here is the chamois, or the chamois, as the French call it. And there are quite a few up here in the outcroppings. So this is the chase, Jan Ulrich around about a minute and 14 seconds behind the two leaders, Vironk and Rasmussen. Then going back to uh, around about 50 seconds in arrears, we have the 
group here being led by Lance Armstrong's teammates uh, on the front there, Floyd Landis. Armstrong doesn't seem to be worried at all. I think he allowed that move to go by Ulrich because he doesn't want to expend more energy than he needs to over this stage in the middle of the mountains. Tomorrow he knows that the rendezvous of the individual time trial to the summit of the Alpe d'Huez is going to be a very important rendezvous. So he's conserving as much energy as possible and he's using his teammates once again, as he has done since this race began in Liège, to absolute and utter perfection. So the two leaders, Rasmussen on the front, the man who, as you can see, with the bands on his shoulders there, has been a former world champion, and that's in the uh, sport of cross-country mountain biking, but since then he's become a very successful bike rider on the road, and that is a nice thing to see so many riders switching across. That was a quick glimpse at the blackboard, one minute to Ulrich and 50 seconds further back to Lance Armstrong. This is going to be a phenomenal chase. And what happens if they come together, I ask? Are they going to attack each other again on the last climbs of the day, all on the eve of a time trial? Because it's going to be a vicious race tomorrow. You, you start uphill, you never, ever alter being uphill. You've got to tear your body apart tomorrow on your own. It's going to be a great day out. Well, there's another very long climb to come. They're still on the descent on the way down into the plateau of the Vercourt. And once they get down there, not very much flat along the bottom part of the valley, and they will cross to the other side of the valley and begin the climb up to the summit of the Col de Chalimont, which is, although not a very steep climb, but it is a fairly long climb at 10.3 kilometres. And I wonder if then they will start to turn up the screws a bit to try and pull Ulrich back into the fold. Well, the gaps are opening all the time, but it looks as though for the moment the extra firepower there provided by Jens Voigt has held the escape of Jan Ulrich. He hasn't uh, come up to, he's a minute four, still behind the two leaders, and he's got to close it down, and it's 40 seconds more or less, so they're coming back now, 38 seconds the gap. That little village we were looking at there just a few moments ago, by the way, was La Chapelle en Vercourt. It was wiped out in the Second World War in 1944 by the German SS troops who came in here, and they actually came in and were parachuted into the area because this was the very heart of the French resistance during that time. So, Vironk and Rasmussen combining their efforts fairly well and fairly efficiently because although Jan Ulrich got himself the lead off the front end of Armstrong's group, he's now having a hard time actually closing the gap between himself and the two leaders stabilizing out at the one minute mark and Armstrong's group now is doing a fairly good job but in fact they have reduced the gap which had climbed up to a maximum between themselves and Ulrich of 55 seconds it's now down to 36 seconds and I would say on the long straight roads they can actually see Jan Ulrich's group on the horizon this is Laurent Brochard Armstrong at the back of his group of men there no panic at all he's using them to perfection behind Armstrong is Ivan Basso the man who tonight, in theory, should be in second place in the overall classification. And at the back end of that group, Andreas Cloden, involved in a crash earlier on in the day. He's the man who T-Mobile have dedicated as the leader of the race as we're speaking, and he should move up into third place. But because of the performance this afternoon of Jan Ulrich and the elimination and detonation of the main field on that very difficult climb a few kilometers ago, I can imagine that Jan Ulrich will climb up into fourth or fifth place in the overall standings. So this is Floyd Landis. Landis, fabulous bike rider, done a lot of good things for himself in the early part of the year when he was given this the freedom to race on his own account. He, in fact, uh, went out to win the Grand Prix, the Grand Prix of the Algarve. As we look further down the road here now, these guys are starting to get themselves organized. This is the group of the yellow jersey. He's got several teammates around him, but he's around about four and a half minutes behind Lance Armstrong. The yellow jersey will be stripped from his shoulders, but he might switch across to get the white one. And that's Sandy Kassar. He's second overall in that white jersey race, but he's a long way behind Thomas Buckler in the standings there. In fact, they're separated by eight and a half minutes. So theoretically, although Thomas Buckler is going to lose the yellow jersey at the end of today, he should keep his lead in the white one. It's a fairly large group here. And I don't think anybody, including myself, expected such a battle on this first mountain stage, but 
the day after a rest day, it seems as if Jan Ulrich has uh, recharged the batteries and recharged the courage as well, because he's decided to go out and try and blow this race to pieces and put pressure on Lance Armstrong and, of course, on Ivan Basso, the man who is hoping now to get up to Paris in second place overall. So the two leaders still conserving a big part of their advantage. Richard Viron has won the polka dot jersey that you can see him wearing here, which indicates he's the leader of the King of the Mountains classification. He's won that competition for six years. And if he can win it this year, it would be a record-breaking seventh. Nobody else has ever done that. Two other riders have won it on six occasions. Uh, Federico Barmontes, the great Spanish rider who earned himself the nickname the Eagle of Toledo, such was his ability to go up hills fast. And, of course, the Belgian climber, Lucien Van Impe, who also won the Tour de France back in 1976. So this is Ulrich, right down into the valley. 53 seconds to the leading group. And the Armstrong group is not very far behind. In fact, 25 seconds apart. And again, Jan Ulrich there, taking a very wide berth. I don't know whether he's just an ungainly rider sometimes, Paul, but he certainly has a job at getting his bike around that bend. Very often you find that big riders are not that good at going downhill because the centre of gravity is a lot higher than need be. I also think that Jan Ulrich has opted today. He's obviously thought today about going out on this move, and you can see he's got very deep rims on those wheels of his. They're carbon fibre rims, which make the wheels exceptionally rigid. So when you're trying to throw the machine around corners like that, sometimes the bike doesn't respond as nicely as you would like it to. Well, he's found himself two good allies here. They've taken a deep breath and they've hooked on to him. So this is Santos Gonzalez of Phonak. Sadly, uh, the team of uh, Tyler Hamilton, who didn't make it the other day, abandoning in the Pyrenees. And Laurent Brochard, former world champion, who's having a great tour. It was rather a quiet one in the first few uh, weeks, but we watched him and he was always in our frame somewhere. And today he really did uh, read the move quite right. He's still quite well up overall as well. He's 23rd overall at the start of the day, here, about 14 and a half minutes behind. I think those two riders with Jan Ulrich thought I cannot actually help Ulrich because he's absolutely flying along. But the distance between Ulrich and the Armstrong Basso group is being reduced slowly but surely. In fact, there's only around about 25 seconds between the two groups. So I'm quite sure on the long straightaways they can actually see Ulrich's group just in front of them. Just looking down here from the helicopter, that is the group of the yellow jersey. He's got a lot of his teammates around him now to try and uh, whip up the pacemaking. Well, Ulrich uh, is being pulled back, there's no doubt about that. Two small second category mountains to come. The chase, remember, aren't interested in Richard Veronk here and Michael Rasmussen because they are 13 minutes and 14 minutes down res uh, respectively overall. So they're not endangering anybody right now. The Armstrong group is a minute seven seconds behind these two. But more importantly, 26 seconds behind Jan Ulrich's group. The confirmation there from the blackboard. And the blackboard man there, as you might have noticed, is a gentleman from Burkina Faso, just across the other side of the continent to me. And I'm uh, not too far away from the borders of Kenya. So as you can see, the gap was confirmed there at 45 seconds from Richard Bironk and Michael Rasmussen to the Jan Ulrich group, and a further 20 seconds back to the group of Lance Armstrong. So Armstrong hasn't panicked. He didn't want to respond immediately to the attack of Jan Ulrich and become isolated. He stayed back, held back, rides with his team. And uh, the important thing is never to panic in moments like this, and Armstrong is a very calm character which is very interesting because in the early part of his career he was never like that at all he rode spontaneously and sometimes he rode spontaneously uh, just a little bit too early in the races well he hand picks his team he's a very much a mature man these days he's got five tours under his belt already looking for the record sixth and uh, obviously he has grown up into this sport and he really is uh, what we call the patron of the peloton but right now the man who accepts uh, all the accolades as the man with the big class the great engine room in that body is now trying to put himself back up where he should be and that's in the top three riders a little bit of help here now coming on from santos gonzalez but here comes the cavalry but the just pulled the there. cars out the gap could not be very much more 13 than five seconds. or six seconds 13 seconds it's been a chase and uh, when he went i thought he was going for a minute or so today but they've worked hard and i say they let's just say the two 
Floyd Landis and Jens Voigt have worked like Trojans to get this race back in for their team leaders, Ivan Basso and Lance Armstrong. And it is still Voigt riding at the front. I don't think he'll be able to issue another chase like this today, so if Voldrick can go again, it may be the big boys will have to counter it. What a brilliant bike rider, Jens Voigt, once uh, tipped as the number one amateur athlete of the world and here to actually come out and produce this effort having been escaped from since the 53rd kilometer of the race there's the gap between them it's not really very much more than 10 seconds Ulrich there sitting in second position it was a very good move it's not a bad move at all because what it's done is it's really blown the race to pieces and on a day when I don't think a lot of people expected this it's going to cause a serious change in the overall classification tonight Santos Gonzalez on the front there, teammate of Tyler Hamilton. This team now has uh, really been put under a lot of pressure because of the abandon of Tyler Hamilton, unable to continue after that very dramatic crash he had on the road down into Angers. And uh, he kept it secret from all of us for a very long time. In fact, uh, that back of his was completely and utterly ripped to pieces. And he said that he just could not go uphill. There was no power in the legs. So rather than become an also ran in the Tour de France, he decided to leave try and get himself back to form so the attack over and I would think uh, one or two team managers would have been sitting on the edge of their seats for a few moments there when they saw Jan Ulrich going off the front of the bike race so Ulrich there back in the group and uh, they've brought back Laurent Brochard and Santos Gonzalez now a little bit of calm will appear in this group, I would expect, as Armstrong now has uh, taken control of the order of the day, and he's pulled himself back to the man who he regards as one of the most talented bike riders in the world. This is Rasmussen on the front, giving Richard Bironk a bit of a hard time here as they begin the penultimate climb of the day, the very difficult long ascension up to the Col du Chalimont. Ten kilometres of climbing once they start. They're on the valley here, or should I say the plateau, the plateau of the Vercors region, which is a magnificent part of France. There are about 75 skiing tracks in this part of the world. In the winter time, it's one of the greatest places for skiing. In fact, it was the scene of the world, the Olympic skiing site back in 1968. Well, it's all over, Paul, but the gap now, by the way, the Maillot Jaune, is a massive six minutes from the two leaders, which puts him five and a half minutes behind Armstrong and Basso, which means that the yellow jersey will be on the shoulders of Lance Armstrong tonight. He will get to start last in the important time trial tomorrow, and that is a big advantage. It's interesting because he is not the man who actually went out on the attack. It was the other teams who actually attacked the race. Armstrong so far has been very careful in whenever he's picked a moment to actually go out and try and attack the race. He actually allowed T-Mobile to be the ones who are the aggressive team this afternoon, and they have absolutely blown this race to pieces because of the attack there by Jan Ulrich. But what it's done, in fact, it's eliminated one or two riders from the top of the overall classification. Riders like Francisco Mancebo and Georg Tochnik and that will have the effect of moving Jan Ulrich by the end of today, probably into the top five. Yeah, which will make him look a lot more respectable too. The Mayo Jean losing six minutes. He could be looking at perhaps ten minutes by the finish if he keeps that up, and he could be out of the top six riders in the Tour de France. Uh, but hopefully he'll keep his white jersey as best rookie, because Sandy Cassar, who is nearest to him, is also in trouble today and behind the yellow jersey. These two riders still hoping that they can do it as they're now heading up towards the climb of the Col de Chalimont, second category. And uh, Rasmussen, both these riders, good climbers. And now that they've caught Jan Ulrich, I think the pace will slacken here, and we should see the gap opening. In fact, as I speak, it's out of 46 seconds. They have absolutely no reason at all to chase down those two leaders because neither of those guys is any threat at all in the overall classification. And uh, the best man there is Michael Rasmussen in 18th place. I think they'll back off just a little bit and let a certain amount of rest come into this group. And that might give the yellow jersey a chance to recover, but at uh, five minutes in arrears, that's an awful big deficit to try and pull back. And Santos Gonzalez, and it's good to see Christian van der Velde here, has just tagged on to the back as well. The white jersey of Andreas Cloden, fourth overall, now looking at a third overall climb today. 
and a podium place in Paris, an incredible result for the bronze medalist in the Olympic Games in Sydney four years ago. He's in the white jersey. Laura Brochard looking for a big rise as well. He's off to the right of our picture. Number 141, if you're just joining us, I can tell you that Iban Mayo, the leader of Uskatel, didn't start today. Uh, neither did Jakob Peel of Team CSC and abandoning Paolo Volotti. Three riders out today, 157 going towards the time trial tomorrow. And this looks like they're coming up to under the banner here, which will be 25 kilometres to go for the two leaders who have been out for much of the day here. They were battling out the prizes on the second category, Côte des Limouches, with 89 kilometres left at that point, and it was Veronk uh, taking that. Well, these two riders now are taking advantage, I think, of the fact that the main interest of that group there with Lance Armstrong and Ivan Basso was to catch Jan Ulrich. So I think they will open up their advantage a little bit more on this final climb out on the open roads, the Col de Chalimont, 10.3 kilometres of climbing. 6.4 miles it's an average gradient of 5.8 percent and it's uh, been given a, a categorization of a second category climb and it is really made only difficult by the length of it it's a very select group of 14 cyclists down there now but some noted names are not included Francesca Mancebo fifth overall Georg Tochnik sixth overall uh, they're not in that group and Sandy Kassar in tenth overall he's not in that group either so we could see a little bit of a reshuffling and Silberto Simone, I don't know what happened to him today, but he's not there. They are now under that 25 kilometers to go banner. The check there is 46 seconds, the gap, six minutes exactly. Uh, we are looking back to the Maillot Jaune of the Tour de France, Thomas Vokler. Yeah, it's quite interesting to see uh, Christian van der Velde in this group from Liberty Seguros. He's uh, really regarded as a teammate of Roberto Heras. Heras completely absent from the front end of the bike race here. Started the day in 35th, 27 minutes behind the man who used to be his leader, Lance Armstrong. And I think by the end of the day, he's going to be closer to the one hour. Just once again, going to amplify the, the fact that it's so much more difficult to have the role as the team leader. Roberto Heras switched teams during the winter months to go to Liberty Seguros to act as team leader for the Tour de France. And I think he's cracked because of the mental pressure of being top dog. Well, we're still on the fastest ever Tour de France, although we expect to slow a little bit now we've entered the Alps. They certainly didn't slow for the first two hours of the race today, so they should keep on the fastest uh, record Tour de France even by the end of this day. As we're now looking here at the two leaders, Richard Verong and Michael Rasmussen. Rasmussen's tried daily to get a result out of the mountain stages. Now, this is rather sad because this is uh, Christian van der Velde. He's had to let go and uh, hopefully He'll hang on because this is a long climb, the Côte de Chalamont. It's over 10 kilometres. And then once he's over the top, though, he's only 10 miles or 16 kilometres from the finish. Just at the back of the group there, Aitor Gonzalez, the winner of the stage just before the rest day. And he's in the breakaway here because of his ability to get in the early morning break, the break that went clear after 53 kilometres. He's one of the survivors of that 14-man group. He was picked up by the Armstrong group and had enough energy to get himself back onto the tail of it. He's a very good bike rider, and I think in the second part of the Tour de France now starting to ride an awful lot better. We're on the Côte du Chalimont, and I think, uh, well, Aitor Gonzalez is about to call it a day too. Yes, he was, uh, he'd been an animator all day today. He was second over the first climb. He was in the original breakaway, which numbered about 15 riders. Uh, but it looks as though he's not quite the climber he has been. We've certainly seen his skill as a time trialist the other day when we raced into Nima because he rode away from the field eight kilometers from home and he held them off. Well, not all of the field, but the breakaway. This is a nasty little climb now. They all are in this region. They're long and steep and twisty. It's a, it's a beautiful part of France now. We're just outside of Grenoble, down the valleys in the Vercourt. It's a great holiday area, but it's even better as a ski station. It was at the Villard de Lance where they had all the skiing events in the 1968 uh, Winter Olympic Games. Ford Land is now settling into the job at hand. His job this afternoon is to set the pace for as long as possible. And if he does falter, then it will be the man behind who will take over, Jose Acevedo. An unbelievable asset, I think, to this team. Santos Gonzalez, one of the early morning breakaways, also now being left behind by the Armstrong group. And uh, although one or two people have expressed surprise at how uh, Acevedo has been riding, they should never forget 
that he in fact finished sixth over six overall in the Tour de France a couple of years ago that just amplifies his ability to be a good climber and also to ride good time trials well he's sitting there in that seventh place overall and uh, look at the rides around him he's going to find himself holding a very high position in this race despite the fact he throws a hundred percent of his energy to keeping Armstrong in a winning position so he's an incredibly good ally to have I'm wondering how Ulrich feels now after that huge effort uh, you have to analyze how they chased him back tonight there'll be no chasing anybody back tomorrow they all ride alone of course but the next day uh, the day after the time trial is viciously cruel through the high climbs of the Alps on the road to Le Grand Bournon and uh, so if Ulrich is feeling anything like as sharp as he was today uh, then you know things could go wrong for everybody uh, as we leave the Alps such a great champion I think he will attack on any occasion now uh, looking further back down the road this is the group Mayo Jeune, the group of the yellow jersey there's Thomas Vukler he held I suppose just a fraction of a hope in the back of his mind that he could keep that yellow jersey for just one more day and I don't think Lance Armstrong himself was going to attack the yellow jersey Armstrong was banking on what's going to happen tomorrow in the individual time trial but it was the other teams who went out on the attack and that more specifically it was Jan Ulrich who put the pressure on the whole field in fact dynamiting the field on a very difficult climb the first category climb of the Col de Charasson and it was on the slopes of that climb that Ulrich I think really took the bull by the horns it was a good move it didn't work but what it did do was eliminate a lot of men from the top 10 in the overall classification men who've got themselves big reputations riders like Georg Tochnik Francisco Mancebo who currently are a long way behind although we don't have all that much of a time check to just exactly where they are on the road so at the back Thomas Vukla this evening should climb up into the podium in the white jersey he will relinquish the yellow jersey to Lance Armstrong as long as nothing happens to that leading group of riders and here he's going under the banner at 25 kilometers to go tough day for this young man but he's been such a courageous bike rider he's earned a place in the hearts of the French crowds over these last 10 days with his courage and the smile that he's had even when he's been suffering. The 101, Richard Viron, 158, Michael Rasmussen. Viron has been a professional for a very long time. He turned professional way back in 1991 for the small French team called RMO, which in fact is based around this area at the time. And ever since then, he's really laid his uh, reputation down at the Tour de France. Armstrong, just sitting there in the slipstream of his teammates, not even worrying at all, I don't think, about the attacks that are coming. He's just got one thing on his mind, I think, right now. He's thinking already about the individual time trial tomorrow. He's probably the only rider in the main field who's been up and down the Al Duez on five or six occasions to completely and utterly get that climb into his mind so he knows the corners he knows the gradients he knows what gears he's going to use when he goes there and he's hoping that he will open up his advantage over the rest of the field in that very important individual mountain time trial those are the two leaders in fact they're slowly but surely starting to pull themselves back to Richard Viron the time check coming in here is 33 seconds and this is uh, the team manager of the yellow jersey here Take on board some drinks, young man. Keep yourself topped up with energy. Keep your courage because you're still going to be the best young rider in the bike race. So stay in touch. So back to a familiar scene now as we're looking at the three pacemakers, well, two pacemakers and the number one man, Lance Armstrong, followed by Ivan Basso, and also down there now, Jan Ulrich, who has shown us there's still a glimmer of hope in that man. The lights haven't gone out completely. And uh, also, I'm delighted to say, Levi Leipheimer has made the split here and will be climbing the overall classification tonight. Yes, he should very easily climb up into the top ten overall because although Georg Tochnik and Francisco Mancebo are not in the group, we actually have no time checks to just exactly where they are on the road, but we do know they've been eliminated from the race by the incredible attack, the brave attack by Jan Ulrich. And I think Ulrich may have thought that Armstrong was going to go with him, but Armstrong, I think, very cleverly, very lucidly just sat back and asked his teammates to lift the pace up as he has done on a number of occasions when he's seen attacks coming he's a very crafty tactician he is and we're looking down the two leaders here on the as we climb the uh, Chalimont which will top at 16 kilometers from the finish but in fact the group is pulling them back on a very regular basis here now 32 33 seconds 
The actual race radio is telling us 25 seconds, so uh, one way or the other, I think the pacemaking here by Floyd Landis is bridging that gap nicely. Again, Acevedo in second place. He's first reserve. If Floyd should crack, he'll take up the pacemaking for Armstrong. It's uh, such a different way of riding a race these days than it was 20 years ago in the Tour de France. These two riders just hanging on. Oh, and Richard Veronk even finding a moment there to give us a smile. He knows they're coming, but what he would like to do is get the points on the top of the climb before they actually do arrive. I can't see them holding off that group now. It's going to be very difficult. That group is just uh, ticking away with an excellent job of work being done on the front by Floyd Landis. Uh, 25 seconds is the gap now, crackling over race radio. And they've still got a long way to go to the summit of this climb. And hopefully, very shortly, they will pull themselves back to the leading group of two. But then the question is, who's going to win the stage? Because there's some big names in this leading group. Yes, there are. And it uh, looks uh, as though Rasmus and uh, Levi Leipheimer will do no helping at the back uh, because he's got uh, Rasmussen up here at the front. Rabobank, two strong men for the overall this year. The saying now is 20 seconds now as we look at 25 seconds. But uh, here, mm -hmm. I'm afraid the Mayo Jean looks as though he's been slipped off by the main field as well. So the determination and the courage has really gone out of his body today and he's still got the time trial tomorrow, of course. It's a tough day for this young man. He's got the yellow jersey on his shoulders here. We've seen all the main contenders at the front end of the race and this man, I think, this afternoon, Phil, really has lost all his energy. Well, the yellow jersey is changing shoulders, probably to Lance Armstrong tonight. The polka dot jersey that's going to be increased in the lead for Richard Baronk. Thomas Volkler should hopefully do enough to claim the white jersey because he's led in two competitions for 10 days. While Robbie McEwen, a very early casualty today, dropped by the peloton. He's riding in, uh, still in his green jersey and should keep that today. He's a long way behind right now, Robbie. And uh, this turning out to be a rather more than ordinary stage in the Tour. We expected the riders to just take it easy because of the eve of the time trial, but instead, They've really raced each other. The peloton has hardly been in a complete pack all day. Well, they raced very quickly over the first couple of hours of racing. In fact, the first two hours of racing over not very flat roads were run off at 44 kilometers an hour. And uh, it was only when the right combination of a breakaway formed after 53 kilometers that they were given a certain amount of freedom. And even in that first hour of racing, the main field actually split into several groups before coming back together and s allowing that leading group of 14 to go free. Well, this looks like the catch now. This Leipheim is the group. has gone off the attack there. Just at the point there that he's about to catch those two leaders, he's gone out of the group now. He's a serious candidate to get the victory. He won a stage this year early on in Spain in the Semena Catalana, and I don't think anybody will respond to that attack because he's a fair way down in the overall classification, and Levi Leipheimer at 14th is absolutely no threat at all to Lance Armstrong. Well, the interesting thing is he's come up to his teammate Rasmussen, Gritting his teeth, Rasmussen's jumped on, and so too are Richard Verong. Now we've got three strong men here, and we're only looking at 16 kilometres to go as they come up to the top. Verong will be doubly determined here. He wants the points at the top of this climb, and he's not going to get pulled back by the peloton at this stage. Well, peloton, there are 13 riders in that pursuing group. This is a very intelligent move by Leipheimer. He's gone up to reach his teammate, and now he might well go on to the last climb of the day in the lead. Good move. He waited to see whether or not his teammate was going to survive. Michael Rasmussen has nothing left in those legs of his. Don't forget, he's been away since the 53rd kilometre of the race and put a lot of effort into the success of this breakaway. But what amazes me is Richard Vironk has been in that breakaway too. And he has the ability to push himself so hard to try and get this King of the Mountains title that he wants to take for a record seventh time. It looks like this may well be a race of records. Well, this is the group here now, and Floyd Landis has continued to pace make, and it looks now he's slipped to the back of the group here with Laurent Brochot, which means that Acevedo will continue now to look for Armstrong. Basso has actually gone round Armstrong, so Leipheimer has caused a little bit of consternation in this group because they are driving up to try and catch him. Well, this looks like uh, a very interesting move coming. I think it was Carlos Sastra there. 
trying to pull the race back together. These guys now are, are thinking about the stage victory. I don't think they're worried about Levi Leipheimer in the overall contention of the race. He is going to move up into the top 10 at, at the end of the stage, as that acceleration by CSC is damning Laurent Brochard here, who will not be able to stay on the wheel, and also getting rid of one of the CSC teammates, Jens Voigt. Well, this is an amazing day now. They're throwing uh, Leipheimer at everything. If he gets away over the top of this climb, he is looking for a high finish in the Tour de France. There is Jens Voigt, who has worked so hard, is now seeing the group he was pacing, uh, riding away from him on the climb of the Chalimont. Called the Chalimont is the, the sixth climb of the day. There are seven climbs on today's stage. Even the final climb up to the finishing line here is a categorized climb, as a second category. And we've seen a serious acceleration now coming from CSC. This is Carlos Sastre. Sastre himself is very high up in the overall classification because, in fact, he is uh, in 12th place at the start of the day, just 10 minutes and three seconds behind. And uh, poor old Michael Rasmussen, I think his day has ended up being just that little bit too long now. Leipheimer is alone. He's got rid of Richard Vironk, and this could be a very well-timed move. Well, Team CSC, they were the erstwhile team leaders in this race. Team Mobile are now the team leaders, and... Uh, U.S. Postal Service are third in the team race, and it looks as though it goes on that way as well. This is now Leipheimer, had one stage of the Saman Ciclista, which is a race in uh, Italy. Uh, Settimana Ciclista, as they come now under the banner there. This is going to be a tough last bit to this race today. It's going to be almost a desperate free-for-all, I think. Well, once they go over the summit of this climb here, they've got a very long descent down into the centre of Villard de Lens, a descent to which will take them down for around about 12 kilometres, and then it climbs up around about four and a half kilometres to the finish. Armstrong still got on his shoulder there, Jose Acevedo, his teammate, but there's a lot of tactical manoeuvring going on here because the team CSC are starting to feel that they've got the ability, I think, to win the stage. My, cat, my bet right now, if I was to go out and put a bet on anybody to win the stage here this afternoon, would be on Jan Ulrich. Well, it's, it's a free-for-all, as I say. There's nobody hiding their effort now. Nobody's saving anything for tomorrow. They've had to race themselves back up here. Remember, Voigt has gone now, but they've got other guns in CSC, and Sastre's brought them back. Richard Varonk will find his legs again. He's just tagged on. We're down to eight men now, and this is the leading group. Armstrong, Ulrich, Basso, Cloden, the men who occupy the top four places, or well, not quite in Ulrich's case anymore, uh, but the strong men of the tour are here and gaining time over everybody. They're opening the big gaps now. These are the big men of the Tour de France coming to the front of the race, and it's nice to see the man on the right-hand side there in the pink helmet and the jersey of T-Mobile. Jan Ulrich today is the man who really blew this race to pieces with an attack that probably scared one or two riders. Armstrong comfortably sitting there. He's got a very good teammate in the group with him just on the left-hand side, Jose Acevedo. And by the way, let's not forget that Jose Acevedo is high up in the overall classification too. He's Armstrong's teammate, but he's sitting in seventh place overall at the start of the day. That's him moving up the outside there. I think he will be lifting up the pace just a little bit more as we get towards the summit of this climb. Most of the work, though, is being done by Carlos Sastre, just pulling the race all back together. Levi Leipheimer's attack has come to nothing, but what it has done is reduced the number of riders in this leading group. Number 17 at the back, Andreas Cloden, high up in the overall classification. There's the yellow jersey. He's managed to get himself back into that group, but what a day he's having. Not a very comfortable one. He's really having to dig deep into his courage to stay in contact with the group. I can see by his pedaling style that he is so tired, that young man. He's held a yellow jersey for 10 days. The pressure, I think, has just become too much here this afternoon, and he's been put on the defensive. Armstrong himself is not the man who went out and attacked the yellow jersey to take it away from him. It was the others that toughened up the race. So this is Acevedo now. A certain amount of calm coming into the main field as we start to prepare for the final few kilometers of this penultimate climb of the day. And this penultimate climb takes the riders up to 1,374 meters, which is not far off 5,500 feet. It's a gradual climb at 5.8%, but again, as you can see, the, the road surfaces here in the Alps are much, much nicer than the roads of the Pyrenees. These roads have a much, much smoother tarmac surface and allows the, the, the bike and the wheels to 
roll across them a lot easier than in the Pyrenean mountains where the surface is covered with a lot of small stones. So Acevedo now being called to the front of the group. There are not very many riders left in that group. Just eight men in the leading group. Richard Viron is holding on by the skin of his teeth, waiting for the possibility to try and get himself some more points. And this is another possibility for him to get uh, a big number of points here at the summit of the Côte de, Ch Côte de Chalimont. Because at uh, the top of this climb here is a second category climb, and Vironk has just been chipping away all day to get himself a large number of points and possibly win this title for a seventh year. Very narrow roads in this region. It's infamous for narrow roads, so they don't want big bunches coursing the way through the Vercourt. Just uh, coming into the last 18 kilometers, we topped the mountain with 16 kilometers to go. Richard Veronk will try to sprint past them for the points, but right now he's slipped down the lines, keeping out of the way of the heat of the night, I think, because this is now a battle between CSC and US Postal with the intrusion of T-Mobile. I'm quite amazed at how hard this race has been this afternoon. I expected a group of 15 or possibly 20 riders to come together to the bottom of the final climb of the day here in Villar de Lens, but that was discounting the fact that a certain man by the name of Jan Ulrich went out and put in a searing attack. And I don't think it actually upset Armstrong too much, but it certainly worried Ivan Basso and the CSC team because it was basically that team that took the responsibility of putting the chase in. And strangely enough, the order will have come from Jan Ulrich's former teammate, Bjorn Rees, who's the team manager at CSC. Yes, that's right. They finished first and second in the Tour de France in 1996 on the same team. And I do believe that Ulrich could have won that tour. But he was handicapped by the fact his team captain was in the lead and it uh, gave Bjorn Rees the victory. We're going back down the road now to over seven minutes to see these pictures of the yellow jersey having a drink. The big thing about being in the yellow jersey, he has been given a lot of help from other teams who have been congratulating him on a daily basis. But, you know, it's been the first day in the Alps which has caused all of the problem as we now head into the beautiful valley of the Vercourt and as we go up towards the finish today via the Col de Chalimont and the Villard de Lance climb, uh, that is going to hurt the legs once and for all. We really didn't expect to have so many riders uh, going out on the attack and once more we've come back to a very select group of small men at the front and uh, once over the Col de Chalimont by the way uh, 16 kilometers to the finish and that will take us right to the finishing line we actually pay a brief visit into the village of uh, Villa de Lens and then come out onto the mountain for the big finish some strained faces there right now Carlos Sastra doing the work but it's hurting and I can't believe Cloden is losing ground here but he's going back to the car, I suspect. But let's not forget, Phil, in the early part of the day, this man was involved in an accident. He crashed about after about 75 kilometers. He was alongside the race doctor's car for a long period looking after an injury. And if you actually look at his shorts there, just on the left-hand yeah. side, you can see that he went down pretty hard. And I think the pressure here by those men at the front is putting this young man into a spot of bother. But I think he, nah, I think he went back for a yes. chat. Yeah. He seems to be OK, but you're right, it was a, he a heavy fall there to rip his shorts. Got a nasty wheel grope coming up. But I think he's gone back to check out on the whereabouts of others. He wants to know whether anything is... any. Uh, probably went back to check on the whereabouts of Vogler, I would think. Uh, because now uh, Cloden will be third overall tonight. With Volkler over six minutes behind, over seven minutes behind, actually, seven and a half almost. And uh, this is the top of the climb, and the Richard, this man is unbelievable. He's just nipped out of the group, takes the maximum points on top of the Col de Chalimont. If he were to win the stage now, which is the only other climb left, he would get double points, so he would have got 40 points, I think it is. I'm not sure that he's going to hang on to win the stage this afternoon unless he tries to uh, slip away on the descent. And I have a feeling in the back of his mind, Jan Ulrich will be the man looking for glory here on this finish up here to Villar de Lens. It's not a very hard finishing climb, but it is around about two and a half kilometres up to the summit of this area known as uh, Villar de Lens 2000. Although the finishing altitude here this afternoon is only around about 1,400 metres. That's Vironk on the back. Just in front of him, Levi Leipheimer, the white jersey in front of that is the German national champion, Andreas Cloden. And they've got a fairly long, narrow, sinuous descent. Armstrong is uh, sitting there in third position. Jan Ulrich is in this group. Levi Leipheimer just sitting at the back there. 
he'll be thinking about the possibility of a, a late attack too. He, he won a stage in March in the Semena Catalana after a long breakaway, and it was on the queen of stages, the most difficult stage, and that was an indication that he'd come back to the form that gave him eighth place overall in the Tour de France a couple of years ago. I think the most serious person Armstrong will pay attention to is the man who was riding third there, Ivan Basso. Well, just looking down at the yellow jersey here, those riders up front now could well be occupying the top eight places in the next day, and certainly Levi Leipheimer is making quite a jump. There's some very big gaps there. Here's confirmation that, in fact, it was Veronk going ahead of Acevedo over the summit of that climb, and Veronk now taking up eighth position at the back of the group. And he is really an amazing bike rider, despite his rather dark past and involvement in a drug scandal. He's always had the courage and the ability to go out and do absolutely ridiculous breakaways that, strangely enough, have somehow or another managed to survive. He's coming up to 35 years of age at the end of uh, this season, and the question is uh, whether he will race again or not next year. There's the possibility, and I believe he's been offered a new 12-month contract, but he said he wants to wait until the finish of this tour to decide whether or not to race next year. And he's actually been selected or pre-selected for the French team for the Olympic Games. There's a very hard climb in the Olympic Games course, and they feel that it's going to be an attacking race. So it may well be that uh, the French send a lot of the riders to the Olympic Games from the men who have performed well here at the Tour de France. Oh, that's interesting, especially as Robin McEwen is going for Australia. He won't like the sound of a hill on the course. These are the narrow roads as we now descend. It looks as though they've been repaved for the Tour de France after the winter snows this year. And they are now inside at the 16 kilometers to go. Nice, uh, very fast twisting descent. You have to be careful down here now. There's not, uh, there's no fences and severe drops. We're, like we're on a, a kind of a plateau in the Vercourt where the, it's very wooded. It's surrounded by beautiful wildflowers as well. And a very popular summer holiday resort. It's about uh, an hour's drive from Grenoble. It's a very tricky finish on the run-in towards uh, the finishing line here this afternoon as well. These riders now facing up to around about a 10-kilometre or six-mile descent into the heart of the city of Villard de Lens. And I thought it was rather a dangerous little circumnavigation of the town too because they go into town, ride around the town and then come back to the same point that they had actually joined the course a few moments earlier and then almost immediately start to climb up to the finishing line. And the finish is, uh, I would estimate, around about a two and a half kilometre climb. That's right, fairly steep. It's only second category, but it'll be enough to, after a day like today, for them to split up this group as they go up to the line. And I wonder, Armstrong again, putting himself in a perfect position here for a small win bonus. He's got to keep a very close eye on Basso because the first three riders take uh, bonuses, which is 20 seconds, 12 and 8 seconds. And if uh, Basso goes for the win, Armstrong will have no choice. He will want to see that gap of a minute 17 close down between him and Ivan Basso. Basso, the only obvious candidate to beat Armstrong now in this year's Tour de France. By tomorrow night, who knows what will have happened. So Acevedo now taking up the pacemaking. He's been kept in reserve for the majority of the day here, just so that he's got reserves for the final few kilometres to take over control at the front end of the main field, and he's doing a magnificent job here. Coming to the front, ticking out the tempo, and on this descent, he's probably pushing himself to around about 65 or 70 kilometres an hour. On the back of the group, I think uh, there was no problems at all there with Andreas Cloden. I think he just wanted a quick word with the team management before he went into the final phase of this afternoon stage. But just look at these roads. They are very small roads through the centre of these alpine passes, and very magnificent to come and ride a bike on if you're not riding in anger. But if you're riding in a bike race like the Tour de France, they are very difficult indeed. The village uh, Martyr de Valenciennes, as you can see there, this is a very old town that was uh, destroyed years and years ago. Just looking down, this very small Halmarx uh, was a key location for the resistance. Well, this is now a situation where who will win the stage and what damage can it possibly do? Will Armstrong now uh, try to herald the entry into the Alps and shock everybody by taking the stage? Or will Richard Veron claim double points by winning it because it's the last climb of the day and he'll increase what is a winning lead in the King of the Mountains?
It's amazing to see that Veronk once again, uh, even though he's a very good climber, he's used uh, the tactic of getting himself into long breakaway situations to build his lead in that King of the Mountains classification. It's a very brave thing to do because you can absolutely and utterly blow yourself to pieces on a stage like that. And Veronk has uh, somehow or another always had luck on his side for that breakaway, sort of a suicide attempt almost to succeed. Yeah. But looking at poor old uh, yellow jersey, Thomas Volkler now, he's wet, met his Waterloo today. Eight minutes is the gap now. Well, There's something happening down there. It's pretty interesting what's happening. It's just crackling through. Two riders are actually regaining that leading group of eight. Michael Rasmussen has made a, a daredevil descent and also joining at the back end of the group as well. You can just see them in the distance there, just slightly. There is Jens Voigt as well. <laughs> He's a great bike rider. A oh, fabulous bike rider. I mean, he's lost Jakob Pill, he's a, his partner in crime in the long breakaways of this year's tour. Pill was unable to start, he's got a bad knee, I believe. Um, but now it puts Jens Voigt as the big, uh, the big breakaway man of the tour. Spent more time out front than any other cyclist in the Tour de France. But you see, they've taken great risks on what is a very narrow road, whereas the leaders, they've sort of done their job at the moment for the day. They're thinking now of how they're going to work out the final climb for the finish. And so they slowed down. The other two would be wise enough to know that would likely happen. So they've taken one or two risks coming down this rather tortuous road, and it's paid off. There's now uh, 10 riders in this group. Yes, Jens Voigt is a very good descender, and he's used those descending skills to pull himself back into the breakaway. He probably bridged around about 30 seconds on the descent of this uh, climb, the Col de Chalimont. And also, we can never dis dis uh, disregard the descending abilities of the man at the back there in the blue shorts, Michael Rasmussen, world mountain bike champion and an exceptionally good bike handler. Now, let's watch them go around these bends here. They just, uh, you see how they lay off the back of one another because they want to see the corner for themselves, not just play follow my leader because these corners uh, can run out rather sharply. And there we go under what will be 10 kilometers to go. Six miles of racing to the finish, and yes, they back off just a little bit on descents like this because if something happens to the rider in front of you, you need a fraction of a second just to be able to change your direction, as we saw Armstrong doing last year. So it's still Acevedo on the front. This, this group that we're looking at now is a group made up of ten riders, and the majority of all of the big names of the Tour de France are in there. Two riders from US Postal Service, Jose Acevedo and Lance Armstrong. In there as well, two riders from T-Mobile, Jan Ulrich and Andreas Cloden. Three riders from CSC, giving them the tactical superiority, Ivan Basso, Carlos Sastra and Jens Voigt. And then finally, two riders from Rabobank, Levi Leipheimer and Michael Rasmussen. And the lone Frenchman in the group, Richard Vironk, just tagging onto the back. And there's another rider returning to the front group here, so that will make 11. This is Marius Sabalaukos from uh, Lithuania, and he's uh, the biggest surprise to me in the leading group as he's ridden a lot of races so far this season, and I haven't really seen him riding at this level of the sport. So we should, in a few moments, have an 11-man leading group, and the name of Laurent Brochard is appearing as well as being not too far away. Now they're getting to a point where it's going to be a little bit tactical as they seem to have turned off the pressure slightly. There he is, Sabaliaskus of Seiko. He's not had a win in his career and we're very surprised to have seen him hanging on to the leaders all day today. But it looks as though he's going to latch on, it's been a good chase by him. Brilliant chase by him and in fact to keep in contact with the leaders on a day where there's been an unbelievable battle. Look at this, Jens Voigt. OK, let's get it organised. I'll organise <laughs> it at the front. I'll ride for a little while, then you come further forward. He's a great man. I really appreciate this bike rider and he's got a great sense of humour. He's one of those rare bike riders who, whatever the weather, whatever the racing conditions, he's always got good morale and you need a guy like that in the team. Of course you do and uh, this guy is demonstrate just how strong a workhorse is in the Tour de France because he just goes back up to a hundred percent of effort he never thinks what might happen down the road what we know will happen is he'll be dropped on the last climb to the finish and then he'll ride home but he's worked very hard to get back just to give some more effort for his team leader before the lights finally go out so Voigt obviously now thinking about setting something up 
before the final sprint to the line. And I think he may well be thinking in the back of his mind that Ivan Basso has the ability to get himself the win here this afternoon. Moving up into second place is Carlos Sastra. So the CSC riders in the red and white jerseys there are obviously thinking about setting up the win for their man. But they're all going to have to be very wary of a certain Jan Ulrich. Because, Phil, in the early part of Ulrich's career, he was a very fast finisher. Well, it, he does win sprints. He certainly was a fast finisher. He wins with his brute strength sometimes on his own, but he can produce a very, very fast sprint finish. What a, what a comeback that would be for if he were to win the stage today. I wouldn't put it past him, but you know, this man has got so much talent. I was actually just working out his, his age in relation to his career a couple of days ago, and I'd forgotten that at 19 years of age, he won the World Championships in Norway on the same day that Lance Armstrong, at 21 years of age, won the professional the pre right. professional event. The difference was uh, Lance Armstrong won in the wet and Jan Ulrich won in the sun. Two very contrasting days in Norway in 1993. These are beautiful roads. Now this again, the, the council here has done well. They've resurfaced this road completely for the arrival of the Tour de France. There you can see about the plateau we're talking about. You run into this beautiful valley of the Vercourt. Looking up, the wind is very strong. They will have a tailwind finish as well today. It'll be a very fast descent of the climb up to the finish line here. And in fact, it's amazing to think, Phil, that the Tour de France hasn't actually been here for almost 15 years. It yeah. seems like yesterday that Eric Brooking got himself it the does. victory up here. And uh, just a couple of years before that, Pedro Delgado, the man who went on to win the Tour de France, he won on two occasions here at uh, Villard de Lens back in 1987 and 1988. I can't believe it's that long ago since we came into this region because this is the most popular holiday region. And um, tomorrow, of course, we nip along uh, to the Alpe d'Huez, which is not far away. Look at this magnificent crowd. We're getting down to the area now where we dip back on ourselves. The other side of the road there, we go through the town, do a little lap of the town, be on the other side of that crowd in a moment, racing for the final climb of the day. Very Thank heavens there's not a big group here, Paul, because the streets we're about to see are ridiculously narrow. Well, I think the organisation knew there was not going to be a huge group of riders coming through the streets of Villar de Lens this afternoon because if it had been a big bunch of 150-odd riders, it would have been absolute chaos. We expected it to be reduced in numbers to maybe 15 or 20 riders, but I don't think any of us expected it was going to be a group of just 11 men. The question now is, which one is going to get himself the win on the stage? Richard Buronk is the man who's furthest down in the overall classification, but he's been in the breakaway since the 53rd kilometer. He has the ability to accelerate at the top of a climb, but I think when these men are fighting out the individual glory for the stage win, he may well find that somebody else in the group is faster than him. I still have a feeling in the back of my mind that Jan Ulrich will be the man looking for the win here. Armstrong has to be very attentive to Ivan Basso. This is... Uh, Sabaliauskas coming back, he's almost made contact, he's chased for a really long time to try and get himself up to that leading group of 10 riders, and if he just makes the contact, that will make 11 men at the front end of the race. Five kilometres. The face now of Jens Voigt, that man is going to continue until his legs will turn no longer. And then he will hope that Ivan Basso, or maybe even Carlos Sastra, but more likely Basso, will perhaps win a stage here. And Armstrong is going to have to go with him if he attempts to win the stage because there's a small bonus for the first three riders over the line. He certainly does. He's going to be very attentive to that. 20 seconds for the first place, 8, 12 seconds for second, and 8 seconds for third place. It could be very important after all. As you said a number of times, Phil, since the start of the Tour de France, Armstrong only won the Tour by 61 seconds last yep. year. It is so important in the sport at this level to make sure you don't lose time anywhere out on the road. And in fact, it's quite interesting the point that Ivan Basso and Armstrong have only been separated on two stages. The first time that they were separated was in the prologue time trial where Ivan yeah. Basso lost 27 seconds, and the second time was in the team time trial where he lost 50 seconds because of the new regulations. That's what gives him the 1 minute 17 second difference between Armstrong and himself as we speak today. And it's not much 117 at the moment. It might open tomorrow if Basso can't ride the time trial as well as we would expect Lance Armstrong to. Uh, but today, this is going to be desperate. These are the narrow streets I was telling you about as we climb into this beautiful town of Villa de Lens, high in the Vercourt. The riders came round this corner. They'll flick off to the right, and thank heavens, because they've got wooden posts in the road. If they go left, there's the flick to the right. 
As we don't forget, the last time he finished in Villard de Lens, 1990, Eric Broekink of Holland was the winner. He was a great uh, time trialist, a great climber and time trialist. And he now manages the team on which Levi Leipheimer is a member. Leipheimer is in this group and he's tagged on the tail of it at the moment as they continue towards the finish at four kilometres to go. We make a long descent now, then a left turn, then we'll make another left turn and we're on the climb. Very tricky circuit around Villard de Lance. The climb climbs up for 2.3 kilometres up towards the finishing line, and it is a fairly difficult climb as well, and it will catch out one or two riders. It's actually the worst at the bottom part of the climb because for the first 700 metres, it's, it's running off at 9.1%. It gets just a little bit easier as we get closer up towards the summit. Well, there is Leipheimer, sat at the back. He's had a great day today, the best one for a couple of years in the Tour de France. Remember, he was out uh, in the first two days with a very serious crash uh, last year. That ruined any hopes. There's the left-hander. The other riders will come off from the right and then go and do the same lap of the town. Very interesting route, this one, as we now run for the hill. Armstrong is sitting at the back of the group there, which is, uh, to me, a fairly dangerous position to be. He's a long way back. Maybe he just wants to keep an eye on everybody to see what the position is going to be of the other riders, the men who he, he knows are going to launch an attack somewhere out on this course. There's Armstrong. He's got the black socks on this afternoon. Somebody asked him the other day, why are you wearing black socks? He said, when I went to the start the other day, I didn't have any white socks in my bag, so I thought I'd put them on. And actually, I quite like them now, so I might keep them on until the end. Gosh, it's not long ago when you weren't allowed to wear black socks in the world of cycle racing, white only. There is Armstrong now. He's gone to the back to observe everybody now as they go towards the finish. He will only move, I think, if Basso moves or Cloden. Those are the two dangerous men to him in this group. The others he may not counter because he would be quite relieved, I think, if the other riders stole the bonuses. Remember, we had 157 riders at the start today. Well, we had 158. We lost one on the way. Paolo Velotti abandoned. Uh, but once uh, the mountains came, the yellow jersey started to crack straight away, and then Jan Ulrich attacked, and that dissipated the whole field in the Tour de France. This is now the select group, which is running to the line of 10. And again, Jens Voigt doesn't know when to stop. Well, any second now, he's about to hit the mountain and the wall at the same time, I would think. And then Acevedo will pick up the pace, making for Armstrong. Cloden is the danger in the white, but Levi Leipheimer has suddenly moved up to number three wheel from the back. Whatever you say, this man on the front is a beastie boy. Jens Voigt is such a tough bike rider. He's been in the break as well since the 53rd kilometre. He dropped back to look after his teammates, and exactly as you predicted, Phil, Voigt has now swung off. This is the steepest part of the climb. This is a 9% gradient, and Acevedo is setting the tempo at the front. Leipheimer is in a very nice position there in second place. Cloden is looking very dangerous. Voigt's job done for the day. He's slipping off the back of the group, but that's not important. What's important is what happens happens at the front well he's got 1.2 miles just to climb that's no big deal now as he has Carlos Sasta that was who's gone we're looking now at the group here and we expect some action to come from somebody here is Voigt as well only Basso left now as expected alongside Lance Armstrong Acevedo is also casting a drift it's going to be a battle royal because Leipheimer is still there and so too is Richard Baronk it's going to be a battle of the big men here the big men at the top end of the overall classification Armstrong has been left completely alone after the job done by Jose Acevedo Michael Rasmussen also just slipping off the back but Levi Leipheimer is still in contact at the front there are two riders in the front group there for T-Mobile now Andreas Cloden and of course Jan Ulrich Vironk has been dropped off the back there not surprising he's been on the breakaway for a long time so too is Rasmussen this no is longer a member of that leading group this is amazing how the strong men have just uh, projected themselves yet again in this Tour de France the men we have come to know from the Pyrenees Basso Armstrong Cloden are still there but this time Ulrich is still there and watch out because our cameraman is going to have to catch up with them here they are now Leipheimer sitting at the back on the wheel of Lance Armstrong Armstrong on the wheel of Basso Basso on the wheel of Ulrich and Ulrich on the wheel of Cloden who is now a workhorse and yet the leader of the team he's the leader of the team but the strongest finisher in this group as I said before is a certain Jan Ulrich you just check out the face of Ulrich if you can get a chance there Armstrong is prepared look at that he's on the large chain ring and he's got right across to the left hand side he's actually thinking about getting himself the win here the other riders in the group uh, on the small chain ring if this comes down to the acceleration Armstrong is in the correct gear as we look at him 
Well, it's up to Levi to make an early move, I think, otherwise he's going to rub shoulders with a tornado because we believe Ulrich is going to wait for that last kilometre and he's going to go. It is not a steep climb, this, but it hurts and it does destroy the rhythm. And it looks as though Cloten, despite the fact he is now lying third overall in the Tour de France, is still the man who looks to his captain, Jan Ulrich. Armstrong looks very comfortable. He's nipped past everybody in this group who's been dropped on the run in towards the line. Look at Levi Leipheimer getting out of the saddle now. He's very twitchy. He'll now, if he jumps move. with about four or five hundred meters He's to go, I doubt now. if they will react. Basso looking over, he wants to know where was Armstrong, what's he doing, is he still in contact with us? Well, yes, Mr. Basso, there he is, right on your wheel. Armstrong moving out, he's making sure now that he's not blocked in. He wants to have plenty of space to manoeuvre if he needs to accelerate. Levi Leipheimer, I don't think, can go. He's beginning to lose ground here, he hasn't got it. Ulrich is being led into the perfect position now. At 500 metres to the line, it's going to be the top three men in the Tour de France tonight with Jan Ulrich spoiling the party. Ulrich Looks, and in fact, Basso is on the limit, I think, as Ulrich now tries to drive it up. Calm, collected, Armstrong is waiting in the wings, and I don't know where Andreas Kloten is getting it from. There's the scar on his leg from the crash today, but he's waiting for the move, and Basso is going to make the move now. As Ulrich continues to lift the pace, how is Kloten doing this? He hasn't got much left. Look at him pushing and blowing there. He wants to stay in his slipstream as long as he can, but he's got to watch Basso doesn't block him in, because now I think Jan Ulrich must go on the inside. Side. He's having to follow Basso's wheel, and Armstrong's got to go. Armstrong has got to take on Ivan Basso. Ulrich is trying to break him as they go around the final bend, taking it wide. That will throw Ulrich off his pace. Lance Armstrong is going to take the stage. He had to do it. He holds on as we get the 1-2 of the Alps we had in the Pyrenees. Armstrong, yes. And in second place it was Ivan Basso. Third was Jan Ulrich. And fourth was Andreas Cloden, and still to come in will be Levi Leipheimer. He had no choice, he had to win. But did you see the way he went round that corner? That was important. That's why Armstrong is such a meticulous man for preparing the Tour de France. He knew where to be when they came into the last little S-shaped corners there. He knew that he could sweep around that corner, open up a gap of one or two bicycle lengths, and then all he had to do was accelerate up to the line. That was a magnificent performance but it was a performance that was built a long time ago, probably two months ago, he came and studied this finish. A big crowd now cheering their man, Richard Viron, up to the line. Viron has done a brilliant ride here this afternoon, and I think he's probably sealed the King of the Mountains title for a seventh year, in the, in, not in succession, but for their seventh year. But that was a remarkable performance, Phil, by Armstrong and once again by his team as well. And that is Lance Armstrong's 17th stage win in the Tour de France in history and his second this year from the Plateau de Bay, which took us out of the Pyrenees. Welcome to the Alps, Villard de Lance. Which is exactly how they've been pronouncing it over cold beers in the US-occupied cafes of the town the night before. There's the result, and with descending bonuses for the first three places, Lance actually picked up eight seconds on Ivan Basso and 15 on Jan Ulrich. Andreas Cloden and Levi Leipheimer finish well up too, but Francisco Manthebo and Georg Tochnig fifth and sixth overall at the start of the stage, both lost over two minutes. Behind them all though, Thomas Verkler was riding his last few hundred metres in the yellow jersey. He came in nine minutes 30 behind the leaders, who were already peddling their respective versions of the day's battle to the media. But the day before Alpe d'Huez, did you expect the pace to be on at this rate? Uh, yes and no. I, I, I personally didn't expect that. You know, it, it was odd this morning uh, uh, in the meeting. I, I, Johan said, so for some reason I think Ulrich's going to make a big attack today, so his, his crystal ball must be really working this year because, you know, uh, they had Guarini come to the front, make a pretty pretty fast tempo shred of the group that we were in, and then, uh, and then he, you know, then he went. But uh, it, was, it was harder than I expected, more, more aggressive. And heute habe ich, denke ich, doch bewiesen, dass ich äh, ganz vorne mitfahren kann. Und äh, ja, gut, das Solo, ich werde zum Schluss auch Dritter. Vielleicht ohne den Solo ich vielleicht, hätte ich vielleicht die Etappe gewonnen, aber ich wollte unbedingt an dem schwersten Berg angreifen, um mal zu sehen, wie die Gegnerschaft reagiert. There was absolutely no concern, no panic within our team. And, and I suspect there was no real panic within CSC because we, you know, uh, Ivan still had Sastra and I had Floyd and, and uh, the ace. And so, uh, and then Bo and Vo Voigt ended up coming back from the break. So it was, everything was under control. Das, denke ich, ist eine Riesensteigerung zu den Pyrenäen. 
Und äh, man muss immer bedenken, dass ich krank war und dass ich äh, normalerweise vielleicht, vielleicht auch schon gar nicht mehr drin gewesen bin. Und ich habe mich durchgekämpft mit dem Regen, mit dem allen und äh, bin jetzt wirklich hier am Limit heute gefahren und äh, ja, will halt Lenz ein bisschen ärgern, will alles probieren. Und äh, deswegen wartet man nicht immer bis auf den letzten Berg, wo dann alle sowieso mitgehen können, sondern man probiert halt vorher schon mal. Und äh, wenn es aufgegangen wäre, wäre ich halt der Größte gewesen. Und so bin ich Dritter geworden, bin ich halt nur der Drittgrößte. Third greatest on the stage and up three places to fifth greatest overall. Lance Armstrong was greatest, 125 ahead of Ivan Basso, with Andreas Clerden third and Francisco Manthebo fourth, although he'd lost a fair bit of time. Thomas Verkler was down to eighth, but he still led the best young rider competition, so he'd be riding in the white jersey for stage 16. So, for the first time since stage five, there was a new man in the yellow jersey, if you can say that about a rider pulling it on for the 61st time. Not that he was counting, Armstrong was already looking ahead to the Tour Showpiece stage, the next day's time trial about Duez. I feel strong. I mean, I, I felt good all day and I didn't feel, uh, I, I don't feel necessarily wasted right now, but, uh, you know, the TT is tomorrow evening, so you know, you've got basically 24 hours of recovery and, you know, we'll see what happens, but obviously Basso is the, is, is the biggest threat. He's the one who's climbing the best, and you know, you'll, you'll see even a good time trial from Jan because he's, he's a time trial specialist, and it, and it looks like he's coming up, as we saw today, but Basso is the, is the big threat.